you so much for agreeing to be on the Rebirth podcast. Um, I, I, I mean, I am honestly beyond thrilled to have you here today. I have been following your work, um, I'm sure maybe like a lot of people, because they have experienced loss. And um, and I've just been, you know, through a social media standpoint, I'm always reposting things that you say, quotes, and you know, little uh, quote cards that you throw up, and I, they're so powerful. And I, I believe what they do is they, they create. Um, it's almost like this this way to start conversation, and I love that. Like it's for me, I never look at them and say uh, the period. It, it, it's there's a follow up like with a question mark instead of a period. Like this isn't the end. It, here's a question. Let's think about it. Let's talk about it. Let's have a conversation. But just, just thank you. Yeah. It, it really is a pleasure to, to to have you on the show, and I know that you, um, you know, we're uh, you know we're going to get into it's okay that you're not okay, the book, the other work that you're doing. But I want to understand, you know, you were in a psychotherapist before you even wrote this book. You were doing a lot of this work even prior to what you eventually what led you down this road that you've been on. Um, talk to me about what led you to get into that space. Yeah, so there's a there's a whole arc there that yeah. in hindsight makes sense. It kind of made sense while I was in it too, but in my 20s I did a lot of social justice work. So I worked with homeless adolescents, um, addicted kids. I worked with domestic violence and sexual violence. I did all of this work in the social justice field and then I was like, gosh, you know this, this it's part of the weird culture that doing advocacy work doesn't actually pay the bills, which mm. is a whole other subject is, that we yeah. could get into. It's unfortunate. Teachers yeah. and force, you know, all of that stuff. Um, so I decided to go back to school and become a therapist because I felt like I could do a lot of work um, helping people understand what their life was, what they wanted for themselves, doing a lot of trauma work. Because you felt yeah. like you could, from an advocacy standpoint, you didn't have the time maybe to be with somebody and help them and, and unpack that? I or? mean, I think those those big systems are such behemoths, right? Like there's there's only so much work you can do on the ground. And not to denigrate that kind of social justice level grassroots advocacy work because mm -hmm. it's amazing. For me, I wanted to be doing something more and something different. And to my, like, what, however old I was, 25, my 25 or 26-year-old brain was like, I'll go be a psychotherapist. And I, I think once I started actually doing the work, doing like community mental health, it was like being in another world. Yeah. Right. So what's that yeah. like being that age and, and being thrown into this space? I mean, I, I get it. You're around doing a lot of advocacy mm -hmm. around a lot of these individuals, but then to take to get that the resources and the tools and the knowledge, but then to find yourself in a space where you're talking to someone and unpacking so much, I feel like to be young and to be in your 20s and to be having these conversations with people I mean I, I mean what's that like I, I feel like that's that's tough in itself but it feels like you were already like life had prepared you for this moment I think so I mean that not to say that starting out as a new therapist wasn't terrifying because mm -hmm. it was I was actually just thinking the other day about my first supervisor and how when she was talking to me about sitting with clients I was like you want me to do what <laughs> Like this person just came in and like this happened and this happened and I'm supposed to sit there and have answers for them? Like I don't have any answers to anything. Mm. At the same time though, and, and I say this about the work that I do now, is I don't do anything different than I was doing when I was a kid, which is observing, asking questions, and letting people say what they needed to say. Oh. That's who I was as a kid. So what I did in the social justice advocacy work, same thing. What I did in my early decade, I guess, as a psychotherapist was the same thing. And what I do now is is the same. It's all advocacy work. It's all observation, asking curious questions, and letting people tell the truth about their own experience. Oh, and I feel like all three of those things, in some cases maybe one or two, but I feel like most people have a tendency to not even implement either one of those. Mm -hmm. Somehow we, somehow we become adults and we completely stop asking questions. We stop remaining curious. We stop observing. And then we stop allowing people to say what it is that they want to say mm -hmm. or what they need to say, right? It wasn't about what they want to say. It's about what they need to say, what's healthy for them. We completely disregard all of that. You know, I'm always fascinated, you know, about 
people's you know upbringings, their childhoods, because you're talking about how it's no different than what I did as a child. Mm-hmm. Well, did the environment that you grew up support you observing, you listening, <laughs> you asking questions? I mean, where did you where did you learn this? Mm, I think I came in that way. Uh, <laughs> well, it's just funny. I can agree with like I have a three month old son, yeah. and and my wife and I always talk about. How he, we, we think he's like a little JR. Like, we mm-hmm. think like he's gonna be like, let's go, let's go. He takes catnaps, I'm ready to go, let's do He's smiling, mm-hmm. he's, you know, it's, and, and, uh, and I was like, yeah, I can see him like being the why, but why, but why, but mm-hmm. why, right? Cause my mom told me that when I was, you know, three, four, five years old, that's all I did. She, I was like, but what's this? And she would tell me, but, but why, but why, but why? And it's like, there's something that just, I was just born that way, yeah. right? There's a part it's of just, just who a, I am. A personality characteristic, right. innate thing. My mom says that when I was little, um, like toddler little, she would sit me down in the middle of the room with no toys and I was just perfectly content to watch. She's like, you would just sit there and look around and just look around. And that's yeah. okay, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of awesome and I spent my toddlerhood sitting around and watching things. Yeah. And I think like you asked, did the, did the environment that I was raised in, um, I'm going to reframe that and like, how did that influence who I was and who I became? And, you know, this sounds so grand. Um, <laughs> but I, I, my parents, God's love them, um, I don't think they quite knew what to do with a little me who was observant and saw details and asked questions. I mean, I'm kind of a pain in the ass to live with now. I mean, I'm sure I was a, a special kind of pain in the butt when I was younger, but that um, the the things that I really remember about childhood were like you know I was bullied a whole bunch as a kid and I would always go to people and like help me understand why you hate me, mm. right? Not that it wasn't painful, but I really wanted to understand what was happening and let's talk about this and. Um, what's under the surface. So that's sort of always my personality. It's like, but what are you really saying? Uh, right? Yeah. And that has both served me well and not well. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. But but do you feel, when you say it served you well, do you feel like it's allowed you to I, uh, sort of develop this empathetic approach towards people? You know, the reason I ask that is because I was having a conversation with my uh, my daughter, who's nine years old. We were sitting in the parking lot of a supermarket um, and we're getting ready to go in and we saw an individual walk across and it was in the evening and he's walking across and he just kind of has some, you know, um, just odd body language, Mm -hmm. you know, patterns. And, you know, my daughter, nine years old, is like, oh my God, look at him, right? Like, what's he doing? Like, you know, and and I said, well, but you don't know. You don't know what's, you you don't know if he just had a conversation. You don't know if he just found out something. You don't know if he's struggling. Mm -hmm. You don't, you don't know anything, right? You can't just look at what you see in this very moment. You have to be willing to dive in and Mm -hmm. stay curious and to find out what's led this individual to that position. And, um, and I noticed as as this individual kept walking, I looked over at my daughter who's sitting and, 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 and I, and she's just looking at him and she's just observing. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking to myself, like, that's good. Yeah, that's good, and I and I think it's always good to be able to ha- to ask those questions, right? Mm-hmm. Because then you're able to one get to the root of what's going on, but then at the same time maybe identify this isn't the right person or the right situation for me to be in, mm-hmm. right? If they don't even know the answer to that question, like oh, maybe I shouldn't, you know, shouldn't yeah. be in this space. Yeah. And 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 I find that to be, you know, we we miss that. Mm-hmm. We miss that as, as human beings. We, we tend to not necessarily kind of dig and want to find out a little bit more. Um, how did that serve you well, becoming a psychotherapist in your 20s? I mean, because do, do you ask a lot of questions or do you just sit there and you listen and, and you know? Both. Yeah. And I think, you know, for me, the job of a therapist is to help the person you're sitting with hear their own truth in their own words or reflected back to them. Going back to that uh, that first supervisor that I had, she said the way that I think about therapy is you're listening for things that your client says so that at certain points during the session you can hand that bouquet back to them. Mm. And I really love that. I might, I might not think about a bouquet these days, but um, that feels a little bit too positive. But that that ability to reflect back to somebody what you just said and that's not always like this soft, focus, pink, fluffy, 
everything is wonderful, listen to the truth that you just told yourself, sort of bumper sticker stuff. Sometimes it's like, are you fucking listening to yourself? Right. Did you hear what you just said there? So what does this say and what does this mean? I, I think that um, sometimes we have this image of therapy being this, therapy or even just compassion of being this really soft, permissive, gooey space. Mm. and that doesn't serve us well either, right? right? There's, um, you know, I, I've been talking with a lot of folks lately about how compassion and empathy is actually quite ferocious and fierce, and we don't wanna go too far into this binary of you're either kind of a shutdown jerk who isn't curious about anything or everything's okay, mm. and we accept all things, and everybody's choices are wonderful, and like binaries don't work for anything except for computers. That idea that you are either an always compassionate, understanding, empathetic person who lets everybody express what they need to express, or you're a jerk, like that's not serving anybody. Right. So in 2009, you experienced something that, you know, sort of changed the course of your work to some degree, right? Um, and it was one of the, the cruelest life events when you... Um, lost your partner, uh, Matt, uh, in an in a drowning accident. Um, what was it, what was it like for someone who it was so accustomed to being in the seat, now listening to other people, to now being on the other side of the table? I mean, do you feel like it? All everything that you ha you knew, everything you had in your arsenal, like the resources, helped you to some degree? No, no. So. The day that Matt died, so the uh, Matt and I had gone out to swim in our usual river, and only one of us came out alive. And while we were waiting for the wardens, while I was waiting for the wardens to find him, they said, you have to have somebody with you. Like, call your best friend. I'm like, my best friend is in the river. And they said, so you, you can't be here alone. You have to find somebody. So I went through my phone and just kept calling people. And the first person who picked up was a friend of mine who was also a coworker. So she was at the riverside with me. And when the lead warden came over and said, I'm sorry, he's dead, I looked at her and I said, I quit. You need to call everybody I work with and tell them I'm never coming back. Oh, wow. Yeah. Why? Why? So before that happened, I was feeling really tired of sitting and listening and sitting and listening. I was starting to feel like a disembodied head. Mm -hmm. I was like, if we could be out in the stables or out in the garden, talking about this stuff, I would feel better. But right now I feel like I just sit here and I sit here and I sit here. So Matt and I had a conversation just a few days before he died. And he was like, well, why don't I just take over financial support of our family and you can close your practice and stop doing this and just wait to see what's next for you. And of course we didn't get to do that because just a few uh. days later he was dead. I never wanted to be a therapist again. In fact, the, the conversation that led into that one um, that I was having, that Matt and I were having together was I was like, you know, the struggles that show up in my office, and I was also doing some consulting work at the time, I'm like, the, the pain of these families is real, but it's arbitrary, right? They're arguing about Xbox time. They're arguing about bedtimes. If there was a natural disaster, they wouldn't be having these arguments anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do arbitrary suffering anymore. And that, that was really what I was feeling like in my own practice. And I, I did really good work, and I know that. And a lot of my client base were um, healthcare providers who didn't feel like they had anywhere else to go to talk about how hard their jobs were. I talked to a lot of, um, a lot of physicians in the hospital who felt like there was no space for them to say how hard it was to watch so much death and suffering and illness every day. And a lot of therapists were my clients mm -hmm. because that same sort of thing. If the helpers hear so much, where do they go for their help? So it wasn't that I did bad work. It was just that I, I felt like a solid half to three quarters of the work that I was doing wasn't real is the wrong word because I never want to say that somebody's pain isn't real because right. every every pain no matter how arbitrary is valid but there was something that was missing for me in fact I had told Matt in that same conversation it was a, it was a deep long conversation at some pizza place um, I said I don't want to be in the pain business anymore 
right? Mm. If, if we had sound effects right now, this mm. would be like the dramatic yes. music. Um, so when he died, I was like, I, I'm out. I'm not, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. And I swore to myself that I would never, ever, ever go back because psychotherapy is useless. Right? Wow. Yeah. And the, the thing is, is that I actually uh, ran into a, a former client of mine a couple of months after Matt died. And I said, you know, I feel like I was a crap therapist and that everything I did was garbage. And she was a therapist herself. And she was like, OK, so let's discuss this. Because at this now you're experiencing yeah. pain on another mm -hmm. level. Grief. You're grieving. Right. Now you've kind of feel like. All the things that maybe I said to other people exactly now don't make any freaking sense to me exactly how is it gonna help me get up this morning tomorrow yeah. morning next week mm -hmm. two weeks from right yeah if you're talking to me about mindfulness practice and let's change your thoughts around this and how can we reframe this and all of this stuff that we do as therapists which they're fantastic tools but they don't belong in every situation. And I think that was the dissonance for me, mm. was hearing my, at that point, former colleagues whipping out all of the tools in the toolbox and trying to use them against this massive abyss. Right. Like, those are the wrong tools for that situation. What do you think's missing? Now that you, you, you know, here you are now doing the work that you're doing now yeah. and knowing what you did then, you have this unfortunate you know, you have this different perspective, right? You have that, you know, mm -hmm. what do you think is missing from that? Is it, is it, you know, is it, is it, is it as easy to say, you know how when you call a customer service mm -hmm. and they immediately, you can ask them, how are you doing today? Right? They're like, hi, I'm JR, how, you know, and Megan says, how are you doing today? And I'm like, how can I help you? Well, Megan asked, how are you doing today? And I'm like, oh, okay. They're so quick to be like, I got to get into like. Yeah, they have a script. Yes. They gotta I got to get to the script. And they don't listen to, oh, this customer has a different situation than the previous customer and the customer after them. And mm -hmm. it's just, I got to go through the script. Is it, I'm not going to, it sounds harsh to say about, you know, a, a, a space that, you know, has an incredible amount of importance and, mm -hmm. and does incredible amount of work. And, um, but is it similar to that to some degree? I think. I think therapists and other providers are done a real disservice in this, we'll just talk about in this country, but it's Western culture in general, that we are trained to see grief as some unfortunate thing that happens. Yes, it's normal and healthy and part of being human, but you got to get out of this as fast as possible, mm. right? Clock's ticking. We can't let you be sad at all. Like, mm. we need to get through this. You need to find the lesson in this. You need to move on from it. You need to draw on your strengths and build back better. Well, I shouldn't say that because that's a current policy thing. Um, but there is that deeply ingrained belief, and it shows up in the way that we train therapists and doctors and other providers, that sure, grief is natural and normal. It makes sense that you would be grieving your baby died or your sister was killed but we need to get you back to happy as soon as possible. Mm. And it's that belief that really skewers all of our attempts to be supportive allies or therapists or even friends, right? We think it's our job to make somebody feel good again and that is not the job. So Matt, I don't wanna be in the pain business anymore. Uh huh. <laughs> and then life says, well, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, about that. About that conversation. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. We're going to give you your bouquet back. Yes. There you um, go. Unfortunately, life thrust you back into the space mm -hmm. and on a deeper level than you ever had before. At what point did you decide to write this book and to do this work and yeah. understand that there is a conversation that needs to be had about the way that all of us experience grief and process grief and, and grieve whether you're the individual that has lost somebody directly or you're a family member or a friend mm -hmm. of the individual right i personally believe your book it's okay that you're not okay is a book that everybody should read yes everybody Agreed. there's no not this this perception that oh i've lost somebody okay or i know somebody that's lost somebody let me give them the book no or listen to it on you know like the audio no Everybody, because we all come in contact with loss at some point, right? Directly or indirectly, whatever. Mm -hmm. We're, at what point did you decide, 
okay, as much as maybe I was burnt out and tired about this, mm -hmm. this is the space that I need to cross into. Yeah. So I would say it probably took about two years after Matt died. So when Matt died, I, I quit my job. I closed my practice. I didn't see those clients again. It's, it's weird to think about now, but back then, even blogs weren't really a thing. Mm -hmm. So blogs have kind of done their peak and then come down and then they're coming back up again. But back then, there wasn't a lot out there. When I went looking for resources as a young widow, what I got was, oh, you're a widow, you must be over 75. So what was out there was mm -hmm. decades beyond what I needed. Or it was um, far more religious than I would ever be, and that also didn't serve me. So there really wasn't a lot out there. And when anything catastrophic happens, you need connection, you need community, you need reflection, you need to you need to have people who are like you, right? And there, there really wasn't anyone out there. There was one person, uh, she was widowed when her husband was uh, uh, struck on his bike by an SUV the year before Matt died. And she had started something Oh gosh, I don't remember what it's called now, but she had started a blog called Widow's Voice and it was literally the only thing that I could find. Now, I'm an obsessive researcher, so and you know, grief interrupts your sleep, so we're talking like two o'clock in the morning, you're spending hours yeah. looking for resources, and hers was the only one that I could find. And Widow's Voice is still set up that way. If you're um if you're a widowed person, it's an excellent resource. She has a different widowed person write each day of the week. And in the comment sections of those posts was where I found people who were like me. It was one of the only places that I found. And being in spaces with people like me where we were all telling the truth about how crappy our experiences were, mm -hmm. I, the way that I usually talk about this is that I have a um, possibly overdeveloped sense of responsibility. And I knew that the world around grieving people needed to change. And I'm very good at what I do. And I felt like I can make things better for grieving people by using the way that I have to speak about things, the, my perception of the world, the way that I've always kind of looked under the surface of things and told different stories. Like I can use this in the service of helping things not suck as much right. for everyone. And there's a, um, where is it in the book? Oh, it might have just completely gone out of my head. There's a section in the book, probably in the, in the introduction or the dedication, where I'm, I'm talking about, like, I do this work for myself. That's it. And it's totally going to make me cry because it always does. But, like, this work is time travel, right? I built and am building the world that I needed mm -hmm. and didn't get. And you had referenced earlier, like I, you said you heard me on a podcast where somebody was asking me about how I decided to do this work. And my answer is still the same, like, what the hell else would I do? Mm -hmm. If there is a need here and I can match that with the things that I am really good at and make things better, not just for individual grieving people, but the people who really want to be supportive, but they don't know how. Right. What else would I do? Mm -hmm. You know, I I was introduced to your work because my 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 wife's younger sister at the age of seventeen unexpectedly passed away. My in laws, of course, parents losing a child, I'm, I'm, um, especially when there's no. There's no answer as to why what happened. It's multiple autopsies and are like, it's just natural causes. And you're like, what does that mean? There's no closure. Not that that necessarily makes it better, but at least you get an answer, right? Mm -hmm. You know, my father-in-law was 27 years NYPD. That was his identity. Protector in his community, protector in his home, protector of his wife, his three daughters. And what you immediately, I had a first hand seat because it's just interesting the way what life sort of, so, so my mother lost a child. Mm -hmm. I was three years old when my sister passed away. I remember seeing my mother cry. I remember 
going up to her as her only son and 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 her you know being a, a child and just going up to her and hugging her and just telling her I love you mommy I love you and just giving her a hug and I and I, as I got older and it didn't make sense to me until like my late 20s early 30s when I started to go to therapy and I started to kind of say hey there's some patterns here with my relationship with my mother with my mother's behavior and I started to realize like oh my mother ne never had the opportunity to grieve, mm -hmm. never had the opportunity to, because she had to take care of me and show up for my other sister and she just had to keep going. And culturally being Hispanic, we don't talk about yeah. vulnerability. Like forget about this conversation about crying. I don't have time to stop and cry. You just gotta sweep it under and you gotta stay busy and find something else to distract you. So as a kid, I didn't understand it, right? But I would always occasionally walk into the house and I just never knew what mom was I walking in, you know, mm. into. Mm -hmm. uh, I, all of us, like what was gonna trigger her? And I remember feeling that way. And so what I developed this was this, this pattern, this behavior that I was always feeling the need to come in and make it okay, fix it, make it right. Even though it wasn't my responsibility or it wasn't, I was the cause of the pain or the trigger. But I had to always fix it. I always make it right. Now that carried into my twenties, and there was some there's some negative things associated with that, where I'm always identifying people that I feel like I can fix, and I'm going to make it right, and I'm going to inconvenience myself just because I want to make you happy. So I started to understand a little bit to some degree, like my mother, and like okay, now I kind of like as an adult, I understand. Well, then when my sister-in-law passes away. And I start to see the way my in-laws are grieving, the way they're dealing with it. My mother-in-law deals with it one way. My father-in-law dealt with it another way. He removed himself from law enforcement. He didn't trust himself mm -hmm. on the job and completely understood that. But his, both of his identities as a, as a protector of his, of his community, which he loved, and then being a father were gone. Now he's home. He's home all day long. And... My mother-in-law read an article where it talked about grief, and your book was one of the uh, books listed for people to. And so she bought the book, gave it to my father-in-law, um, and we didn't know, but apparently he had been reading it. Now, my father-in-law really had a hard time making kind of, you know, turning that corner and kind of implementing a lot of it. He, he, he really struggled, they, you know. When he passed away in the summer of, of 2020, but we found the book and that's when we realized he had been reading your book this whole time. And for me, I've just been in this space of, I can't tell you how many conversations I had with him. I can't tell you how many times he and I sat down and over a drink sometimes, not over a drink, and just unpack so much and just allowing him to share, allowing him to vent. And, and, and I, I, you know, I don't know where I'm going with this. I, I think it's, it's more because, you know, he, he, we always tell people like he died from a broken heart. Mm -hmm. And I would always hear my father-in-law, my mother-in-law talk about what they would say because of course they're they're mad at you know people would come up to them and say well you know god had a different plan mm -hmm. people would come up to say well i can understand because i lost a pet or i lost my uncle or i lost you know like um her time on earth was you know was and and my in-laws as you can imagine are like like, you know, she's in a better place. That was another thing that, that they would hear people say all the time. And my mother-in-law said, what are you talking about? I don't know what life is up there, but I do know that she had two sisters. She had a father. She had a mother. She had a supportive community, supportive family, loving family, all the friends in the world. She was on her way, big, beautiful personality. She had a pretty good freaking life here. So yeah, what do you mean? Like, she has it better. Like... And to me, what that did is that introduced me to this other notion that, uh, oh, we don't know what to say, we do really we? We really don't. Everything we're taught about how to respond in the face of someone's pain is wrong. Right? And you touched on so many things in there. So if we go back to the experience that you described being a kid, I mean, one, kids watch their grown-ups 
for a living, mm -hmm. right? That's what they do. Yep. And you adapt to the situation that's in front of you. And we won't go too far into it, but like as a kid, you're like, my survival depends on making sure everybody is okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna make sure everybody's okay with the tools and the skills that I have available to me. Right. So that makes perfect sense to me. And you know, you're talking about a time period where um, your mom did exactly what she knew how to do. Now there's, um, there is race and class and gender in all of the things that you just talked about. Right. When you pull one string in all of this stuff, everything starts to unravel because we can't talk about the ways that um, we support or don't support grieving people if we're not also talking about who has the luxury to be sad when they're sad. Mm -hmm. Well, it is not the single mom with three kids under five who has to work six jobs just to keep the rent. Right. Right. So we, we can't talk about that without at least acknowledging the systems. There's so much intersectionality. There's so right? much intersectionality in there. And then we, we go to your in-laws and the way that you describe that is, you know, here's your father-in-law responding in the ways that he is trained by his the culture that he lives in, the profession that he's in, to be the defender, the protector, the one who has the answers, the one who's like, I, you know, this is what we do and here's this X, Y, Z equals this. Um, and your mother-in-law, you described this to me earlier, that she, she got busy, mm -hmm. right? Which is what we tell people to do. Mm -hmm. Just stay busy. Don't think those thoughts. Don't have those feelings. Can't let you be sad. Just stay busy. Put yourself in the service of some other thing so that you don't think about the reality of what hurts. Right. That's the message that we tend to give women or female-identified folks. And the message that we tend to give men or male-identified folks is fix it, find a solution, muscle through, don't show any weakness, we will do it this way and this will happen. And we're, we're basically screwing everybody with that narrative, right? Because people are doing what they have been told to do. It's so interesting hearing you say that because one of the things that I feel like I just, I feel like I just acknowledge right now is that you know, my, when I got into my late 20s and, and early 30s, when I would be around my mother, that if something triggered her and she got quiet and I can see on her face like something's something's weighing on her, it made me uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right? And it's like this element of like now I feel like I'm walking on eggshells. That's not helping anybody. But then it also makes me now question, well, what's my, like, right? Mm -hmm. I like to think that I'm, observant mm -hmm. I like to think that I ask questions I stay curious and I like to think that I listen however even though I may be those three things why am I still uncomfortable mm -hmm. what is it about it and if I have that feeling and I've been around this I can only imagine a co-worker a cousin a, a friend yeah. feeling the same exact way if not more like I I'm gonna be there and then I'm gonna sort of push away because mm -hmm. What do we need to be doing differently? <laughs> okay, because... first, first we're going to let you off the hook. I do this for a living, and I still feel incredibly awkward and sometimes say the wrong things. Yeah. Right? So just because you're curious and you have good insight does not mean you know what the hell you're doing. Right. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's also something to Whew. be said. Like, Thank you like, for that. Like, breathe, man. You got this. It's so, okay. <laughs> Um, one thing I want to pick up on there, you said, like, you know, I, I see something in my mom and my visceral response is to get uncomfortable. Like, that's just patterning, right? It's just there's where curiosity comes in. Like, oh, I notice that I feel uncomfortable when I notice this. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's a different way for me to respond. What do I need in this situation? That's sort of what I mean by curiosity. It's curiosity for yourself too. like, oh, I recognize that I feel really uncomfortable right now. And I really want to make this discomfort go away. Mm -hmm. Maybe the ways that I would normally do it, trying to cheer the person up, make things okay for them, maybe I need to do something different. Right. Right? And what I love there is um, we also, you know, I, I think that this is why I said earlier that, like, when we start talking about being curious and observant and asking questions, we're still human and we have prejudice and presumption and all of these things. So I can look at you and you can have like, you know, maybe you said something and I noticed your shoulder moved a little bit. And in my brain, I'm going to go, oh, your shoulder moved because this is happening over here. And really, like you just had a mosquito bite yeah. your shoulder. So 
assumption and presumption, like that is a normal human thing to do. And it's why we always want to check out our assumptions. Mm -hmm. So is it okay if I go through your interaction with your mom that you just described? Of course, yeah. Okay, so uh, in the service of like, here's something you can do. <laughs> so Like that, I'm getting a free therapy session right now. Like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, why not? It's, it's a good day for that. Um, so you're in this situation and you notice something, some expression passes over your mom's face mm -hmm. and you go, ooh, I noticed that I'm uncomfortable. Okay, well, have you checked that out with your mom? Like, there's this thing that I notice that happens when you have a certain facial expression. I interpret that as meaning you're feeling really sad or, um, you know, you're, you're angry at me or whatever it is. And I have this reaction. What is that true? Right. I love the question. Is that true? When I see your facial expression do this, my guess is that you're feeling X, Y and Z. Is that true? I love ending that observation with, is that true? Because one, it gives the other person to tell the truth about the, what their own face is doing. Right. And two, it helps you to get out of the habit of assuming what somebody else needs based on your understanding of the situation. And your understanding of the situation is only one corner of it, mm -hmm. right? Is that true? Mm -hmm. Gets us out of a lot of the um, tar pits of being human. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love, you know, I think, you know, I love, you know, not ending it with a period. I, yeah. I, I love what a statement. No, it's more of a question. And that's the curiosity. That's the asking the question. Mm -hmm. Right. That, 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 that's um, what, what what would you say? I mean, you know, what would you say to people that, you know, like, for example, like, as you alluded to my father in law right the profession that he was in and of course his his definition and my definition for a very long time of what manhood is is that you're not vulnerable you don't show this right you, that that's a sign of weakness we can go down the list of mm -hmm. what sure. people think and feel and it's one of those things where it's like you're like come on man come on you're you're there you know you 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 feel it you see it come on like just go to that, you know, retreat, mm. go to yeah. that, you know, I got a solution for yeah, your lack of vulnerability. You just got to do this. Listen to that podcast. Yeah. Just Whew. do it. You know, seems so good, doesn't it? And yes. Yet. And then, but and what do you do? <laughs> like, I mean, it's like there's, that's why I say, I think it's just so important for people that even aren't directly experiencing loss and grief to still read it because yeah. What are the tools for us, for bystanders, for yeah. supporters, for, for, for people that are, you know, love and nourishers? Like, what, what the hell do we do? Yeah. What, how do we? That's the big question. Foot disease, foot right? to mouth disease. Like, we're yeah. suffering from that. The cool thing is, okay, so backing up just a little bit, knowing what to say in the face of somebody else's distress is really hard. It feels really awkward and you feel really helpless, right? Those are super uncomfortable feelings. So even if you quote unquote know better, like I know it's not my job to fix this, but we jump in and do, we give suggestions, go to this retreat, read this book, you should really try this, they're in a better place, remember your happy memories, think of the good times, they wouldn't want you to be sad. All of that stuff that we say is a way to manage our own helplessness. It doesn't really have anything to do with the person in front of us, right? We feel with each other that is that's not some fluffy airy fairy thing that's neurobiological fact right like if you're in a really good mood a good mood is infectious so i'm going to feel better being around you because my nervous system is upregulated by your nervous system same thing with any other feeling state right this is why some place spaces feel good and other spaces don't but that's a whole other conversation like neurobiologically we influence and impact each other so if I'm sitting with you and I know that these horrific, unpredictable things happen to you, I'm going to start to feel what you feel. I'm going to start to feel with you. That's not weird. That's just what happens being mammals. And that feels really uncomfortable to me, especially if something that happened to you is um, – I have, I have a theory that is not yet scientifically proven, but the more out of order or random or sudden a loss is, the more people come in and try to make you feel better. Yeah. 
right? Because it's like, oh shit, like if that can happen to you, I'm actually vulnerable and the people I care about are vulnerable. Let's shut this down really quickly, oh. right? So again, that function of helplessness, oh, of feeling powerlessness, of feeling awkward. We don't like to feel awkward or helpless. So I would say 97% of what we say in the face of somebody else's pain is managing our own anxiety and helplessness. How do we get to that place? I mean, how do you get through that? How do we, yeah, how do yeah. we get through that and yeah. get to a place of where we can then, if someone is still grieving mm -hmm. 10 years later, yep. which is possible and is completely fine, mm -hmm. right? Because I think that's another thing yeah. that you identify. Yeah, we can like get to that one. The timeline, like mm -hmm. forget, like just what, but if someone's grieving a year after, a week after, yeah. a decade after, it doesn't matter. I'm still going to al put allow myself to be in this space and be present. Mm -hmm. Like, how do we get there? Yeah, the one key, which is not easy, is to embrace the awkward. Right, letting go of your ideas around um, how you can fix it. Right, if we can just break that habit of fixing other people, we oh, will do man. a lot better. Sorry, and I use that one specifically because <sighs> you talked earlier about being a fixer, but our impulse is to fix if we look at our medical models are um like we call it transformation porn right but like anytime something bad happens you're supposed to come back better than before stay strong resilience um, happiness is seen as equivalent to health right all of our messaging from pop psychology to what you get in your doctor's office to what you see coming out of hollywood it is all the transformation narrative of um, you might be sad a little bit, but happiness is really your birthright, right? Mm -hmm. So we're soaking in that, right? And the reason that I bring that up is if you don't know what to do in the face of somebody's pain, it's not your fault. You have been taught that your job is to take your friend's pain away from them, mm -hmm. right? Once you understand that it is not your job to fix somebody's pain, it is your job to come up underneath them and support them inside it, then it may not be your fault that you don't know how to do it, but it is your responsibility to learn how to do it better. Really what we all want is to feel loved and heard and supported no matter what happens in our lives. We all want that. And if we're going to get there, then we all need to start talking about how we show up for our own pain and everybody else's pain, but which is it, super awkward. But it, in that, yeah, if someone gets to that place and they're like, "I'm my job is to come up underneath them, as mm -hmm. you said, and just support them." For example, and I'll just I'll just make it personal so it makes more sense versus sure. me trying to create like this a uh, situation. But yeah. in my father-in-law situation, mm -hmm. you know, he passes away. So many people that are connected that have been with him and listening to him and trying to support him as much. And I'm not saying there there wasn't individuals that, I mean, I fall guilty of this, mm -hmm. of like, well, do this and do that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, go, oh, sure. Yeah, like, I, so. Human impulse. However, when he passed, there were so many of us that felt, did we do enough? Mm -hmm. Could we have done more? How do we get people, because again, this, this sort of encompasses everything we're talking about. I think that I'm very vocal and I and, and I like to listen, but I'm very vocal as well. Mm -hmm. Like, come on, man, like, you know, like we can find groups and we can find spaces for you to, to share and to mm -hmm. be vulnerable and talk. That's what you need. You need to find that you're not alone in this and, and somebody else has gone through this mm -hmm. and, and, and you guys can connect with each other. And, that, and that's what I would always tell him. And you need to talk about it. You need to write about it. But I still feel like I didn't do enough. Yeah. So if I'm sitting there just listening and just observing and supporting, coming coming mm -hmm. coming underneath them, mm -hmm. and the result is still we lose them. Yeah. How do you not have guilt thinking that shit? I I should have and I could have done so much more. Mm -hmm. All I did was sit there and listen to them. Mm -hmm. How do you find peace in that? Because yeah. right. Mm -hmm. So. The first thing that I will say to that is, of course, you feel guilty. Right? We all do that. We all look back and think, I could have done something like differently. Like hindsight. Like <laughs> right? And nobody can talk you out of feeling guilty. So 
if we take a step back from that, what we would normally do, what people would expect me to do in this position, is tell you you did the best you could, you did what you knew how to do at the time, you might have done, like, I would talk you out of feeling guilty. I'm not going to talk you out of feeling guilty. You feel guilty. Okay. What do you need inside that? How do you need to support yourself with the weight of the fact that looking back, there are things that you might have done differently that might have changed the outcome? Mm -hmm. Have this conversation a lot with folks who, whose person died by suicide, mm -hmm. right? You are always going to look back and say, I should have done this and I should have done this, even if you like dedicated your life to keeping the person alive, right? This is what we do. We always look back and say, I wish I had done X, Y, Z. The only thing you can do moving forward is look at that experience and say, there are things I regret and I would like to not regret as much in the future. So what do I want to do now so that future me can look back and say, I really did the best that I could do and it still didn't work out the way that I wanted. Right. Right. So we want to tell the truth about your experience and let that be true. Mm. Yeah. So going back to your, your father-in-law, um, there's a, a, a great, um, what's the word that I want? It's like a, a structure, but um, do you know about motivational interviewing? Mm -mm. Motivational interviewing is fantastic, pulling out a therapy tool here. Um, motivational interviewing comes out of the addiction field. And I'll, I'll try to make this relatively brief example here. So <laughs> um, if you have eight DUIs and you have to come to, th I don't know how many it is now, but um, not you, but like to, <laughs> wait, let's say that over again. I if do not have You eight. do not. I do not. I, that was you in the colloquial sense. I was thinking of like, how many DUIs does it take before you're mandated to see, to seek therapy? So that's where I was going. Like, I don't know. I don't know what the number is. <laughs> Gosh, foot in mouth. Speak of that. Embracing the awkward. Um, so let's say that you've had a bunch of DUIs and you need to come to therapy, right? So, if you come to therapy, you don't think that you have a problem, but you have to come because it's court mandated and because your partner is sniping at you and you have to come. So sort of the traditional way of looking at that is like you need to admit that you have a problem and mm. powerless over alcohol yep. and rah, 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 all of those things that we do. And what that tends to do when somebody doesn't feel they have a problem is they just defend themselves. Right. Nothing is sinking in there. So motivational interviewing is this great process where you meet the person where they are. There's a pre-contemplation, contemplation, action, and maintenance, if I remember the system. I mean, it uh, sounded convincing. It's great. Like, mo <laughs> I love motivational interviewing. It has such helpful things for us in so many, so many ways. Um, so that person in my example of, like, have too many DUIs, you mm -hmm. have to come in for court-mandated therapy, they don't believe they have a problem. So helping them... Um, fix a problem that they don't think they have is not going to work. So the motivational interviewing approach would be like, so everybody around you thinks that you have a problem, but you don't feel like you have one. What's that like? Or everybody thinks that you have a problem with alcohol. I hear you say that you don't feel like you have one and yet you're here and you don't want to be. So there is a problem. Let's talk about that one. Mm. Right? So if we apply that to what you were talking about with your father-in-law, a therapist, not that you needed to know this, but a therapist might start with, what's it like to feel like you've dedicated your life to being a protector, both of the community and of your family? And now you're in this experience where everybody is telling you to undo everything you've learned about being a man and be vulnerable. Mm. That sounds like it would be really tough. Ooh, what did we do? Mm. We is named, that true? We named the problem in the, w in the room, right? The problem is not you need to get yourself to a space where you can be vulnerable. It's, wow, you're in this situation right now where suddenly you need to be vulnerable, and that is not something that you've done before. Mm -hmm. That sounds like it's hard. Is that true? Earlier, when you talked about getting into this work and, and – it, you know, you talked about how it's it's this work is timeless and you got emotional mm -hmm. and you know one of the things that I wanted to ask ask you is in relation to is your do you have like a is there like a hel a way to have a healthy relationship with loss mm. and when I when you started to talk about that and you started to choke up a little bit. 
I, 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 I couldn't help but think to myself, well, that's healthy, right? What yes. she's doing. It might not feel healthy for me because I'm like, what do I do? My, is my inclination <laughs> to come over here and be like, give you a hug and be like, it's okay. Like, are you okay? Like, yeah. is it okay? Mm -hmm. What can I do? Like, but I'm like, that is healthy. Absolutely. For you. And, mm -hmm. and so when people think of this definition of having a healthy relationship with loss, the fuck does that even mean? Mm. Super good question. If you look at pop culture and the pathology disease based medical model, Healthy grief is grief that is over within six weeks. Really? Mm -hmm. Definitely not a year, man. If you are still sad a year after your sister was killed in a crosswalk, you're doing it wrong. And that's like across the board. It doesn't matter what you've lost, who you've lost. That is correct. A spouse, a child, a dog. Mm -hmm. Six weeks. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> so. Wow. There, There's... Um, you might have seen the Washington Post article. I've heard that there's a New York Times article coming out about prolonged grief disorder, and we don't need me to go on a super rant about that right now. But the the challenge is is that so we had um, Elizabeth Kubler Ross's stages of grief that came out in the late '60s, and minor sidebar on that, like she never meant them as the stages of grief. Those stages came out of her observations of people who had just been given a terminal diagnosis. So she observing her patients who receive terminal diagnosis, she's like, here are some things you might experience. You don't have to experience these, but I want you to know if you experience this stuff, you're normal. So mm -hmm. she meant those stages, air quotes here, um, she meant those stages as a way to give comfort and validation to people going through an experience they'd never experienced before. And what happened with her work is it got twisted and reduced and applied to grief. There are five stages. You must go through them in order. You can't uh, stick around in any of these stages for very long, especially not anger. Uh, Good Lord, like you're in that anger phase. You need to get to acceptance. So it sort of weaponized what she meant as a comfort. And you can find the stages of grief everywhere. They're in pop culture. They're in media. You probably know exactly yeah, what I'm talking yeah, about. And yeah. you didn't go to grad school and learn these things. Um, and I think what's happened sort of in, in contemporary modern times is that our medical and clinical professions kind of get it that the stage model doesn't work anymore. But because we're not accustomed to talking about grief, sadness, all of these things as normal parts of human experience, they're sort of grasping for what's the next pathology-based reductive model that we can do to make sure that everybody is back to you know, productive capitalist um, as soon as possible, right? Again, we come back to like you pull one thread and you start talking about systems and policy mm -hmm. and what do we actually believe is um, optimal human experience? Well, it's happy, it's productive, it's, you know, all of these things that don't really allow space for being sad, for having to work three jobs to support your kids, for the actual reality of being human, mm -hmm. right? So these... Um, pathology-based models, which is the way that I understand these, like prolonged grief disorder, you know, six weeks, six months, if you're still sad about your baby's death, then we need to talk about medication and other intervention. That, we might, as providers, we might talk about that with a lot more nuance. And as with everything, that's not a, a, a simple binary issue. There are a lot of reasons why you have diagnosis codes, all of this stuff. But th the way that the general public understands things is not with nuance. It is, oh, grief bad. Okay, be happy, right? And we do that to ourselves and we do that to each other. Like, it's okay for you to be sad, but only for five minutes yeah. and you need to look on the bright side and find a way to come back stronger, right? This is why that the first part of it's okay is like down the rabbit hole of pain avoidance, right? Like we have really fancy ways to bypass our own pain and other people's pain. Right. That's nothing new. We just kind of have um, prettier words to to get people out of their real experience these days. Mm. What would you say to someone that is has experienced loss? Because, right, like I look at this is the only thing I can sort of say it's somewhat similar to. So after I, I was injured in the military and I, and, and, you know, I was labeled as a being a veteran and 
medically disabled. And I was like, what the hell does all this even mean? These are new titles to me Mm -hmm. that everyone else is using to identify me so they can have a better understanding of who I am. And I never self-proclaim like I'm a veteran and I'm I'm medically disabled, right? Whatever. But when I got out of the military and I started to interact with what we call civilians, Mm -hmm. I started to, I found myself, if you talked about complaining about oh it was this was so difficult you know yesterday or this weekend or this past week or whatever if it wasn't sort of this major thing i would look at you and be like shut up Mm -hmm. what are you talking about i was 22 23 24 years old and i would have this and i found myself feeling this thing towards people like i don't even want to be around people anymore like god you're complaining about nonsense Mm -hmm. like do you know how many people are suffering yeah. In your community, forget about the world. Let's not macro, mm-hmm. you know, look at this from a macro. Micro, it's in your community. People are suffering. And you're talking about what? Mm-hmm. Your laundry, your coffee, your trap. Like, get mm-hmm. out of here. And I had to, like, at one point realize that's not healthy. That's not healthy because I'm closing the door to be able to communicate and connect with people and potentially give them a different perspective. Mm-hmm. So I started to restructure the way that I sort of like, hey, it's not their fault. They haven't experienced what I've experienced. That's okay. It's not to say that they won't later in life, but at this stage they have not. Don't judge them. Don't look down on them. Don't look, don't treat them as if there's nothing you can learn from that individual. Mm -hmm. And so I started changing my relationship with just people, just even strangers, right? That I would start to talk to. At what point do you allow some uh, you you sort of again i don't want to get into this time frame thing because i don't want to fall into this trap of (laughs) capitalism (laughs) never not a social worker yeah (laughs) but what is the approach that someone to say okay you've experienced loss you get annoyed when people come up to you and say i can relate because Mm -hmm. i've lost this or that Mm -hmm. you know they're in a better place. All the things that we've talked about yeah. before. At what point do you allow them to understand that they are now in a position to be educators and to educate? Mm. So, no surprise here. I have lots of thoughts on this. <laughs> so you're talking about multiple things in here. And I, I think one of the things to keep in mind is right timing. Right? So if you just lost somebody and I'm sitting there at a coffee shop with you and I'm bitching about my laundry. Right place, right time. It's not that my laundry isn't annoying, but really, are you the one that I should be talking to about it? Mm. Right? So there's an awareness of the other Mm. that we need to keep in mind. Is this the right audience for the venting that I currently need to do? Mm. So that really asks people to pay attention, observe, and also read the room. Mm. (laughs) There was a person, um, so Matt and I met at a coffee shop and uh, excuse me, Matt and I met at a coffee shop. And who was talking he, about the laundry? Not laundry. <laughs> it's worse. And I'm playing right into my own hands here. So we met at a coffee shop, um, had his memorial at the same coffee shop. And I used to mm-hmm. go there because he disappeared suddenly. Right. And so I used to go to the coffee shop because I was like, no, we were here. We were here. So we had a lot of casual acquaintances there. And there was a woman who every time I saw her. She would come up and be like, how are you? You know, that little pat in the head tilt. How are you? And then she would launch into a thing about how I just needed to go dancing because that's what she needed after her husband's surprise divorced her. And then she would go on these tangents about how terrible the divorce was and how she knew exactly how I felt, right? So people don't know what they're doing, right? I call that grief hijacking. Right. Mm -hmm. Where here's this person in front of you who is experiencing something and you think you're empathizing by coming in with your own story of pain. But now we're suddenly talking about you. Now we're talking about how terrible her husband was because he surprised divorced her, you know, and she needed to go out dancing. Um, We think sometimes that we're being helpful when we share our own experience of loss. Right. This is one of those um, uh, side effects of never really talking about grief, what we think we're supposed to do is actually one of the least helpful things we can do. Mm. It's not to say that you shouldn't share your own story of loss. And I'll link back into what you're talking about with your father-in-law. Like there are, I love how you um, you were telling him 
there are people who know what it's like to be you and you deserve to have that place, which is actually accurate and true. Um, but it's like, if I'm sitting with you, maybe you and I have shared the same loss for the purposes of this example, you and I have shared the same loss or the, the same relationship. So let's say we both had a sibling die mm -hmm. and your, I hate doing this cause it's like, oh God, I'm gonna bring this stuff up. But like, let's say that your loss is fresh. Mine was several years ago and I hear about this. And my impulse is to go in and say, oh my God, I know exactly how you feel. This is what I needed. I just want to let you know that you're not alone. La, 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 la. A much more skilled and effective way to share your own story of loss is to say, I'm so sorry that this happened to you. I lived through something similar. It is not what you're living through. I just want you to know if you have questions about things, there might be some things that I'm able to answer if you're ready or if you're interested, right? We want to offer, not insist. Mm. right that is a very skilled response to the loss in front of you the human in front of you it's not that your experience isn't relevant we want to let the person at the center of the current conversation lead you want them to be able to have the agency to say i would really love to talk to you like did people treat you like you were invisible and only your parents mattered which is something really common with sibling loss um, that's a really cool interaction we want to let the grieving person in our midst lead the conversation. And so often when things happen to you, you feel like you had no control over the situation. So we want to let the grieving person have control over what they talk about and when. Mm -hmm. Does it feel helpful to um, ask me questions about my experience? And if that person says, no, not right now, I'm like, okay, cool. Here if you need me. Right? So there is a way to empathize and claim shared territory without steamrolling over the person in front of you that takes a lot of self-awareness which not everybody has yes. right there's a learning curve there um the the other thing here is every loss is valid this is something that gets really sticky and mucky really quickly because that person who was going on and on and on about her divorce days after matt died her pain is valid and she deserves to have a place where she can talk about it. This isn't it. This isn't it. Right place, right time. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, you know, people were coming up to your um, to your mother-in-law and saying, "I know how just I just how you feel. My dog died." Now, that is a terrible thing to say to anybody, right? You never want to say, "I know exactly how you feel," because even if you and I share the same loss, I don't know how you feel. Right, right. I don't have that relationship. I don't know what that looks like. Yeah. We can have textbook exactly the same experience. Our siblings died in exactly the same way at the same age. We are not the same. Yeah. Right. So there's a presumption there that I know exactly how you feel, and mm. I never will. Right. I can be curious about it, but I don't know. And this conflating of losses. Right. For people um, who have any kind of loss, but most of my work is with people who experience out of order or atypical death. So suicide, violent crime, natural disaster, illnesses and accidents that happen at a younger age. Um, being compared to the loss of a pet feels particularly challenging. Right. Again, right place, right time. And what I say is um, that person who is talking about the death of their dog, that loss is valid and it is real and it deserves to be supported. No. But if we say that, what we get is, you're saying that my loss isn't as important as yours and then suddenly we're arguing about whose loss is more valid and my dog was like my family to me and all of this stuff and then we're battling. And why are we battling? No. We are battling because we treat compassion like a scarce resource. What do we do when resources are scarce? We fight over them. You talked about the person complaining about their laundry or about their everyday things. The fact is, is that most of our conversations are conversations about pain. Most of our conversations are conversations about pain. We just don't recognize them because they're normal. You're waiting in line at the coffee shop and you ask the barista how their day is going and they say it's not not actually that good like the dog was sick all night and so I didn't sleep very well and then I missed the bus coming in here and the boss was cranky and I just spilled steamed milk all over my feet and we say at least the sun is out <laughs> we just missed our daily practice of how do you respond to somebody else's pain do you cheer them up do you reflect it back to them 
Do you say nothing? Right. We have you. You asked me earlier, what do we do in the face of like catastrophic illness, injury, grief? Right. Well, the skills that we need to respond to those situations with skill and grace and empathy are the skills that we need to respond to the barista who had a really shitty day. They are not different. If you only practice responding to the person in front of you in case of an emergency, you're going to feel even more awkward than you would have right. regularly. Right. So we have all of these opportunities to practice. The reason why I bring that in after I'm talking about, you know, my dog died. I know just how you feel. Um, if we don't allow people to be sad about the things that they're sad about, then we have to have these um, uh, skirmishes at the boundaries between losses, right? How dare you be sad about your dog when I am sad about this? Mm. How dare you? There's not enough compassion for me, so how can there possibly be compassion mm. for you? Now we go back to social justice, systemic inequity. How can we have compassion for refugees if there isn't enough for me? We are battling over compassion, which is not actually a scarce resource if we don't treat it that way. Can someone that's experienced one type of loss share space with somebody else that has experienced another type of loss mm -hmm. and still still find value in that? The, and, and what I mean by that is I have heard people that for you know have lost whatever they've lost and they say I only want to talk to somebody that has experienced exactly the same thing but what you just said is even though we both have lost siblings I don't know how you feel because there's a lot of variables that go into well your relationship with your sibling was very mm -hmm. different than my relationship so it's you know like there's a lot of things that fall yeah. into that but I've heard people say in the military space, I only want to talk to people that have been in the military, that have deployed, that have mm -hmm. experienced. And I personally, me, JR, I have found that to be completely false. Like, mm -hmm. I have spoken to people that have experienced exactly what I have and find really no connection yep. and find nothing. I find myself talking to people like yourself, and I'm like, ah, there's, mm -hmm. there's something there. Yeah. But how do we retrain the mind to rethink who and what we mm -hmm. should talk to? Yeah, I, th I think sometimes we, one, if you won't only want to speak to people, I think the military is a great example. If you only want to speak to people who have military experience, that's valid, right? I, I won't talk you out of that. Right. I think sometimes what we conflate is that if I go to a therapist and they're, you know, they they think that I my grief is a problem to be solved. They're going to tell me that I need to practice gratitude and I'll feel better in six weeks. Then I'm going to say, oh, you're treating me like this because you don't understand loss. Let me go find somebody who understands who who has also lost a partner, right? So I think sometimes we conflate bad therapy with, oh, if only they share my loss. Mm -hmm which is sometimes accurate and sometimes not, but you also describe this really well with, like, let's say you seek out somebody who has, you know, was deployed and had a life-altering injury and all of this stuff, and then you still may not resonate with them. They might have a belief system or other experiences or a different cultural background, different family background, that you two just completely miss each other. So there's no guarantee that if you go to somebody who has a very similar experience to you that you're gonna feel the validation and the support and connection that you long for. Um, I run a writing course called um, Writing Your Grief. It's a 30-day writing course. And I usually talk about that, like the writing is the Trojan horse for the community. <laughs> and one of the really cool things about that community is we have losses of all kinds in there. We do skew pretty heavily towards deaths, but there are other kinds of losses in there. And what I love seeing is that when you let people tell the truth about their own experience and teach them the skills to honor and validate other people's experience, then they learn from each other. But we only learn from each other when we feel like our experience is valid and honored. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. That I mean, that's the big secret. Let people tell the truth about their own life and don't take it away from them. So, you, you know, going back to your practice prior to mm -hmm. what you experienced. You talked about, you know, sort of being burnt out in a sense, right? Being tired. 
and now you've been propelled into this work mm -hmm. that you have been doing ever since Matt's, Matt's unfortunate passing. You know, you wrote, it's okay that you're not okay, right? You, um, you released How to Carry What Can't Be Fixed, a journal for grief. Um, okay, so you're, you're, you're probably more in the thick of it now <laughs> than you were before. How do you take care of yourself? Where, where is this? We hear a lot of conversation here lately in the last year and a half, 20 months, talking about self-care. Mm -hmm. What does Megan do when she's now leading this writing course, when she's now hearing people from all over the world that have connected? Because your book, the audio version, has, is in multiple languages. Mm -hmm. So people are connecting with your work all over the world. Yeah. And you're having to read messages, you're having to meet people, and there's a lot emotionally that you take on. How do you take care of yourself mm. to where you don't find yourself being burnt out again like you were in your 20s? That presumes that I'm not burned out. <laughs> so we can start there. I think, um, you know, for the first several years of doing this work, it was all me, right? That sort of classic startup entrepreneurial thing just happens to be in the grief space, working 12 and 14 hours a day, seven days a week, absorbing all of the stories mm -hmm. and I used to think that my capacity for witnessing other people's pain was limitless and I have discovered that there are actually limits right my capacity to witness that is really vast but it does have edges mm -hmm. and the the reason that I can continue to do this work is because I have an amazing team because I don't carry it by myself mm -hmm. anymore I have certainly hit points in doing this work where the pain that I witness in others has colored the world so intensely that um, it was, you need to stop doing this altogether or you need to understand that it's gonna destroy you, mm -hmm. right? And again, we go back to my um, uh, overdeveloped sense of responsibility. There's no way I would ever leave this work. I know that people panic when I say that sometimes I'm tired. Um, I'm not leaving this work because as we've said before, what else would I do? And and there are ways that I um, have agency in changing the way that things are, right? And that's important to me. Self-care now is more about leaning on my team helping them manage their own capacity to witness pain. And that for me means conversations about like, how does this change the way you move in the world? How do you unknow what you know? How do you live in the world knowing what you know? Right? These are questions that I ask the people that I train, um, clinicians and medical providers. How do we move in the world knowing what we know mm -hmm. and live here anyway? Right? How do you form relationships? How do you have a good time knowing how horrendous the world is in any given moment for so many people mm. right there's no easy answer to that for me it's about um timeshare in the psyche right going out into the natural world or playing with my dog or being really ferocious about identifying something beautiful because sometimes the world is impossible and for me the for for me, one of the big ways that I take care of myself is um, trying to feel effective in my work, <laughs> which, you know, that just kind of outs me as a workaholic. But um, <laughs> it's it's that sense of agency. Yeah. Right. So the the work that I've done up until this point is is awesome and amazing. And it's really, really cool to see the impact of the work in the world. And starting to put some concentric rings around that. Like, how do I start doing stuff that's fun for me, which is changing the culture, um, having bigger conversations about pain of all kinds. How do we show up for the world when it is this broken on this regular of a basis? Yeah. For me, agency and beauty are the things that I do to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. uh, one last question. Yeah. When we talk about grief, I think our, a lot of this conversation has been about being adults. Mm -hmm. So we kept using like the dog as an example. Mm -hmm. So um, I have a black lab, he's 11 years old. My daughter is nine years old. To tell you how much he means to our family, it's to, I think I have to allow, I have to tell you that for 
a very long time, ever since my daughter could start speaking, she would always tell people that was her brother. Mm -hmm. And if he wasn't around, people would literally think it's a human being, mm -hmm. right? That's how entrenched he is in our family. Well, he now has cancer. And my wife and I went back and forth, like, when do we, like, tell her? And when, you know, and I said, we we have to tell her now. And 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 because with cancer, you never know. Mm -hmm. Give her the, the opportunity now to start understanding, to start trying to process as much, to start preparing as much as she possibly can in her own little mind and to potentially ask questions. When is it, I mean, when is it too early or is it is there a, is there sort of a hmm. you know a time frame of when you're like it's okay this it's okay to you know she experienced the loss of her grandfather right mm -hmm. she saw everybody around her grieve and still sees my wife and still sees my mother-in-law mm -hmm. still sees my sister-in-law you know grieve um you know but it's like people would say you know like you're nine i'm not going to sit down and talk to you and i'm like i want to be able to give her what she needs and i think there are a lot of children out there that unfortunately experience loss mm -hmm. at what point do you start to have that dialogue mm. with them so i'm really tempted to to use what we're hearing in the news a lot right now is like how young is too young to talk about racism mm. you are living in a racist culture you we us all of us it's never too young to start talking about that because you're experiencing it from the time you're born when is too young to talk about loss or sadness or grief? There is no such thing as too young. There is age appropriate language. Yeah. But people are experiencing grief and sadness and big emotions all the time. Little peanuts and big peanuts and everybody in between. So the question for me is not how young is too young to talk about grief and illness and death and impermanence. It's what's the language that I use to help my kid understand that anything that they're experiencing we can talk about mm. and that they can look to me, right? And that they can bring their confusion and their sadness and their concern and their questions and whatever else they want to bring, that this is a place to talk about it. I think one of the things that parents try to do and you touched on this a little bit about your sister's death. Um, I think what parents try to do is shield their kids. Mm. I don't want I don't want my kids to see me cry. I don't want them to see me upset. I don't want them to feel like they have to be the grown up and take care of me. Remember that kids watch the grown ups for a living. Yeah. yeah. And so they're watching. Oh, when somebody dies, we don't talk about it anymore. Oh, when somebody dies, we drink, right? Like a three-year-old's not going to be like, oh, mm, death <laughs> equals alcohol. But they're absorbing. What do the grown-ups do when things get tricky? Mm -hmm. So it's not to say that you want to go to your child. You know, let's say that your partner dies and, you know, their parent dies. You don't want to go to them and use them as your confidant and sob and like, and then this, this person said this to me because they're, they're not, it's not like, again, there are no binaries here, right? You don't want to suck it up and present that sort of strong face to your child. Neither do you want to treat them as a confidant or a best friend because they are still a child. But there's a middle ground in there, right? So you might say, um, I'm really missing your mom today. When, when I feel like this, I feel really sad and I kind of just want to get into bed with a cup of tea and take a nap. What do you do when you're sad? You see what we did there? Mm -hmm. I didn't have to erase my feelings. I said, this is what I do. I also didn't tell the kid you should do this when you're sad. I opened a conversation about what's it like for you when you're sad? Mm -hmm. We just laid the foundation for people have different experiences around the same event. Sadness is healthy. I take care of myself when I'm sad in this way. And we assumed that the kid knows how to take care of themselves when they're sad, or they might not know, right? That one simple little at written interaction, we just hit so many good things, yeah. so many good things. And the thing here is, is that um, you're, nobody's gonna have one perfect response. It's going to feel awkward, but it's gonna feel awkward if you try to maintain a stiff upper lip and be brave and be strong in front of your kids. That's one direction out of feeling uncomfortable. The other direction about feeling uncomfortable is to lean right into it. Be awkward. You're gonna be awkward in either situation. Let's choose the awkward path that leads slightly more to awesome town. Yeah. I, 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 I can't tell you how much I've loved this conversation and listening to you. I, 
my mind was already racing um, with, mm, yeah, I did that. Mm. Mm, maybe I should restructure the way that I, you know, I'm. Our, there's a lot of takeaways for mm-hmm. me. And I know that there's a lot of people listening right now that are, are probably going to feel the same exact way. And so I, I thank you for um, making the time and, 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 and sharing space with me and, and having this, uh, this very important conversation. Um, I, I want people to be able to find a way to stay connected with you and be a part of your community because, I mean, you're doing so much. I know podcasts is, mm-hmm. you know, you're working on that right now. And so I just would love to give you the opportunity to just tell people where you are and how to find you and how to find your community and stay connected with you. Yeah, we're everywhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, so Refuge in Grief is the is the website. And we think about Refuge in Grief as sort of the grievers community. So on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, although Twitter is more for yelling, but <laughs> yeah, um, <it's... laughs> on, on all the social I'm media. I'm here. <laughs> yes, well, I love it for that. Uh, let let the social media platforms be what they are. Uh, but at Refuge and Grief on all of the social media channels, um, the Writing Your Grief course is honestly one of the best things that I've ever made, I think. And it, it really is about coming into a place where you're allowed to tell the whole truth about your experience. And not only do you get supported and validated and, and, and hear your own truth reflected back to you, but you also get to learn how to do that for other people. And I think we've touched on this a lot today of like, no one knows what to do. And like, well, there are some skills that you can use to help you get more comfortable with not fixing other people's pain for them. And the the Writing Your Grief course is a great place to play around with that and and to see the kind of community that gets built when you allow people the truth of their own experience. It's it's kind of the, the dream connection and community that we all want and we don't always find in the outside world where we jump in to give each other advice. So big plug for the writing your grief course and you mentioned the podcast so there's a new podcast coming out it's called here after and we always put a pause between here and after because it it really is this statement about something has happened in your life and here we are after that and how do you survive Mm -hmm. it's not so much a show about grief for grieving people it's more about, you know, we're, we talked a lot today and, and, you know, there's a lot of talk in the media about, you know, we need to start talking about mental health the last 20 months, the last three years, honestly, the last millennia um, has been really hard for a lot of people. And now we're really focusing on like, oh, mental health, be sure to take care of your mental health and talk to somebody. Well, who are you supposed to go talk to when the helpers are also swimming in the same sea as the rest of us? So hereafter is really... Um, a, a show about what is it like to be a helper and how do we talk about the stresses on the mental health care system and the medical system and how do we help the helpers be able to care for themselves and care for others so on the job and off. I'm super excited about it. It's that thing where I get to start talking about these bigger cultural sweeps yeah. and how they intersect with real human lives yeah. on the job and off the job. Essentially all of your work now coming to one place. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty awesome. That's awesome. Well, Megan, um, I, I feel like I want to invite you back and, and I'll to always have come back. another conversation about a lot of things that we didn't tap on, you know, we didn't touch on today. Um, but I just I, I can't thank you enough and for for leaning in into your unfortunate, you know, experience and feeling, but creating a space for so many people and um, and showing people that at the end of the day, you can create your own rebirth. You can have your own rebirth. Um, that it doesn't have to be that that experience doesn't have to be the story the only story there can be other stories and so I just I just thank you so much for the space and this is really has hit a special place in my heart and um, just thank you you're so welcome